Hey guys, this is Dr. Harrington, and today we're going to talk about seizures. Now, to start, why is this important? Well, for beginners, 5 to 10% of North Americans will have a seizure sometime in their lifetime. Now, this statistic includes things like trauma and febrile seizures, and febrile seizures uh, may occur in up to 5% of kids. But that still leaves about 4% of people who, within their lifetime, have at least one unprovoked seizure. And the incidence of epilepsy, and we'll talk about the definition there, but it means recurrent seizures, basically, is about 1 in 2,000. So remember, incidence is newly diagnosed cases, and that's 1 per 2,000 people per year, all right? Which takes us to a prevalence of about 1 in 150 people. Now, the number is kind of all over the board here, but there's about 3 million people, people with epilepsy in the United States. <clears throat> now, demographically, this is divided primarily in kids under 10, and then those over, really over 75, the incidence starts rising at about 50. Primarily 65, 75 is where you really see the uptick. And this makes sense because if you think about it, the under 10 group is the group that gets febrile seizures. It's also the inborn errors of metabolism, congenital, uh, congenital disorders. And then the age over 75 are the folks that are more likely to have cerebrovascular disease, to have developed head trauma. Uh, to have in general vascular problems, uh, not just strokes, but also uh, you know things like hypertensive problems, uh, lacunar, small uh, subclinical lacunar infarcts, things like that. All right, why else is this important? Well, people with ep uh, epilepsy have a two to three times higher mortality than age-matched controls. Now they also have a lot of problems like hypertension and diabetes. They have decreased physical activity. Uh, probably because they don't want to get out and have a seizure while they're trying to bench press 200 pounds. Um, they also, lots of them, if they can't get their seizures adequately controlled, can't have a driver's license, which limits the uh, kind of jobs they can have. So lots of problems there. Um, and then the rate of sudden unexplained death in the 20 to 40 year old demographic is 24 times that uh, that's, uh, the expected mortality. And this is kind of like a SIDS for adults. A lot of these people are found face down. The theory tends to be that there's some association with apnea or with arrhythmia that may be caused by a seizure. All right. And then lastly, uh, quality of life. Right. These people have seizures. That's uh, sometimes a debilitating problem to have. It makes it difficult to go out in public. It makes it difficult to hold down jobs. A lot of the seizure medications have really bad side effects, things like Depakote or valproic acid uh, that are teratogenic. So women who have seizures in their reproductive years may have problems getting pregnant or having, uh, you know, caring to term a baby. So moving on, to begin talking about seizures, you really need to learn the nomenclature. This is just like orthopedics. It's got its own lexicon that you need to understand to understand it and to be able to talk about it. So to begin, what is a seizure? Well, a seizure is a sudden change in behavior that is the consequence of brain dysfunction. It's a pretty simple, broad term, and you'll understand why as we get to talking about the seizures and how people behave during them, okay? And from a pathophysiology perspective, uh, this primarily happens because of an imbalance between NMDA and GABA. And when NMDA wins, you have a seizure. <clears throat> All right, and that even in itself is probably more than you need to know clinically but just so you basically understand kind of the, the background behind it. There's two classes of seizures. There's generalized seizures, and then there's focal or partial seizures. Now, a generalized seizure is what it sounds like. It is a seizure that goes to both hemispheres. It is generalized. And within this, you can have convulsive seizures, so tonic-clonic, myoclonic, atonic seizures. And this is the kind of um, muscle contracture or shaking that most of us are familiar with, and there's also non-convulsive. Now, usually when you hear non-convulsive, non somebody's talking about status epilepticus. It's talking about a prolonged seizure. And usually this is the result of a partially treated generalized convulsive seizure. Okay, you can also hear non-convulsive with partial seizures. Um, anything that doesn't involve shaking or moving. And lastly, you can have absence seizures. Now, absence seizures are the classic seizures of childhood in which a child stares off into space. Usually they're described as staring off during school. It's a child that otherwise was doing well in school and then suddenly has these episodes of what people think is daydreaming. Sometimes this can be hundreds of times a day. Sometimes this can be several times per day. It's usually very brief, resolves without a postictal phase. Uh, so they come, they snap right back to consciousness, but they may be a bit confused because they just missed the last five seconds. 
okay? Then there's partial seizures or focal seizures, and that is what it sounds like. It happens in a focal area of the brain, and when this is written about, it's usually written about, it's usually divided into frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe, although sometimes um, the, the focal area of seizure activity is in between, but this helps us organize them. Now, this is also divided into simple uh, focal seizures, and what that means is there's preserved consciousness. The patient is aware of what's going on. They're alert. All right, and then there's complex focal seizures, and this involves an altered level of consciousness. And most commonly what you see with this is an automatism, so non-purposeful repetitive motor activity that may be somewhat coordinated, may resemble voluntary movement, okay? It may be what they were just doing, like preservative automatism, an inappropriate continuation of previous activity. Could be a de novo automatism, new activity with the seizure onset, okay? Like lip smacking or swallowing, okay? And then within these categories, you have unprovoked seizures and provoked seizures. Now, an unprovoked seizure is what it sounds like. It's a seizure uh, that had no inciting event, at least none that we can tell. A provoked seizure means that something caused the seizure, and without that thing, the patient would not have had a seizure. Now, glucose is probably the most common thing we hear about in this regard. A glucose less than 45 is fairly likely to cause a seizure, but anybody that has a glucose less than 90 that's seizing probably needs glucose. All right, so hypoglycemia, sodium, calcium, and magnesium, your cations, when any of those get low, you're at a higher risk for seizures. In particular, we tend to see sodium, so hyponatremia. Alcohol, so chronic use can cause seizures, but also acute withdrawal can cause seizures. Things like trauma, when you get your head, uh, when you get your head hit, when you get a concussion, any high-speed closed head injury can cause a seizure. All right, and a lot of times this resolves. It puts you at higher risk for a repeat one, but for the most part, uh, people tend to resolve from these and not have another seizure. Infection, and most commonly encephalitis, probably on board exams, the most common ones you'll see. Uh, uh, one that you'll see is a herpes encephalitis. And then inflammation, general inflammation, things like lupus or multiple sclerosis. Now, epilepsy is different than just seizures. Epilepsy is... Uh, basically chronic seizures. It's ongoing seizures more than one. So it's two or more unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. So it keeps happening again and again. This is the definition that for most of you guys ending up in some kind of primary care field uh, or some non-neurology field, you're going to need to know. Now, if you go into neurology, you have a couple more options. It can be one unprovoked seizure with the expectation of another. We think it isn't going away. And usually uh, that is cited as I think you have a 60% chance of having another seizure within the next 10 years, whether that's from imaging studies or EEG or history. And then lastly, it can be the diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome, usually via EEG, but also from history, family history. And this is usually done by a neurologist. From where you guys are sitting right now, I want you to know that epilepsy means two or more unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. So two seizures more than 24 hours apart. All right, and the reason that's important is because that helps us prognosticate. How likely are you to continue having seizures? Which means how likely, uh, or how, uh, how does this favor the risk benefit of putting you on anti-epileptic medications, lots of which have lots of side effects. So moving on to some other, other vocabulary. Um, these are some basic words. Now on the handout, I have lots of vocabulary. These are kind of the bigger ones that I think you need to know. I think it's at least good to be familiar with all of them, but you should really understand these well. So ictal comes from the Latin ictus, means hit or strike or blow. And if you've ever seen somebody have a seizure, particularly a tonic-clonic seizure, it's exactly what it looks like, like they've been hit with something. So ictal means seizure, related to a seizure, which means... Post-ictal means after the seizure, right? So ictal tends to be the shaking phase. Post-ictal is the afterwards confusion, sometimes associated with things like paralysis or inability to speak, aphasia, uh, numbness or tingling, almost always associated with confusion, all right? The post-ictal stage. And this is a way that we can differentiate between things like syncope and seizure because syncope uh, should resolve immediately. They should wake up and be right back to normal. Whereas a seizure should have a phase with the exception of absent seizures where somebody's confused. Now the movements associated with seizure 
And there was lots of terms, so I didn't include things like myoclonus um, here. But the big ones that you're going to see are tonic and clonic. So generalized tonic-clonic seizures are the ones most of us know. And tonic, or the tonic phase, tonic movements, tends to look a bit like we think of tetanus or decorticate posturing. And the theory here actually is that this is the same pathways involved in decorticate posturing. So we talked about that in the decreased level of consciousness lecture, right? Going through the Glasgow Coma Scale, when you flex your arms and you extend your legs, which is the most common kind of tonic posturing, but you can also have um, flexion of the arms and the legs. Uh, and then there are some specific things like Fencer's posture that involves certain specific kinds of tonic posturing. But it's a contraction of muscles. Clonic activity is the classic shaking that we normally think of. And uh, in a tonic-clonic seizure, people tend to have a tonic phase where they squeeze up over several seconds and then begin shaking. Now, a Jacksonian march is usually in reference to a partial seizure. So we talked about that's uh, it's a focal seizure in one area of the brain. And then this gradually spreads to encompass other parts and sometimes the entire brain. All right, and so it marches across dermatomes, it marches across brain regions, and it's called a Jacksonian march. So, for instance, somebody may have a partial focal seizure, okay, a simple partial seizure, um, where their right upper extremity is shaking, which then becomes their right lower extremity shaking, and then they then become aphasic, and then they have a generalized seizure, tonic-clonic seizure. That would be a Jacksonian march. All right, lastly, there's something called versive movements. And there's a couple things associated with this I think are important to know. So people that are having a partial seizure that have secondary generalization, so though this begins as a partial seizure and becomes a generalized, for instance, tonic-clonic seizure or a generalized tonic seizure, okay, they can have a couple of kind of uh, classic findings. So one's called a figure of four posturing. And this looks just like if you can imagine a cheerleader making a number four. You have one arm flexed across your body and the other is extended at your side. All right. This, in association with what's called aversive movement, tend to signify that there is going to be secondary generalization. And aversive movements mean turning. This actually comes from the Latin vertere, which means to turn. So makes pretty good sense, right? And it tends to reference the head and the eyes, and they tend to turn away from wherever the seizures are, the focus of the seizure. So just like this guy, these pictures were taken uh, from start to finish, nine seconds apart, and you can see this is all involuntary movement. He begins to look up over his left shoulder, his head turns, and he buries his face in the pillow. This is tonic movement. And uh, shortly after this, the, uh, this gentleman developed a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. All right, so it's called versive movements. And if you read about seizures, you'll see that word a lot. Okay, then there's an aura. Okay, an aura is a subjective sensation that precedes and signals the onset of a seizure, but can also reference a migraine. All right, some seizure literature uh, suggests that this can actually be the entirety of a simple partial seizure. And there are such things as uh, migrainous auras without the headache. Okay. But an aura is a subjective sensation, and this can be anything from autonomic sensations, sensations like butterflies in your belly, or like you're going over the hump of a roller coaster, a rising epigastric sensation. Okay, it can be things like nausea or palpitations. All right, and this is different than prodromes, and a prodrome is just a sensation that you're going to have a seizure. There's no subjective sensory uh, element to this. It's just, I think I'm going to have a seizure. And sometimes folks with seizures know that this is coming. So it's, there's a difference there. Um, and then lastly, automatisms. And this is non-purposeful repetitive motor activity that can be coordinated, uh, is usually somewhat coordinated, and may resemble voluntary movement. And there's two kinds of this. There's preservative automatism, so inappropriate continuation of previously ongoing activity. All right, so if you're crumpling paper, you continue to have a crumpling movement. If you are washing dishes, you continue to wash dishes, okay? Or there's de novo automatisms. This is new activity after the seizure onset, and this is usually things like swallowing or lip smacking, sticking out your tongue, things like that. All right, and then lastly, status epilepticus. Now, this is particularly important that I think all of us know because this is the dangerous thing. Status epilepticus is classically defined as a seizure-lasting for more than 30 minutes. That's a long time if you can imagine somebody having a tonic-clonic seizure for 30 minutes. Um, usually two minutes feels like forever.
right? But you have 30 minutes. And the reason that the, this was the original definition is because this is when brain cells start to die. But functionally, we've moved that back to about five minutes. You'll see it between five and 10. Uh, I like the five minute definition. Anybody who's had a seizure for five minutes need to be treated functionally like they are in status epilepticus. It gives you 25 minutes to work with this to try to get the seizure to stop so that they don't have any brain damage. And this is important because if you look here, the mortality rate is pretty low for seizures until you hit the 30 minute mark. And then it fairly uh, quickly climbs. Now, you may be shocked to see this going on for 10, uh, 10 hours up to days, but we talked earlier about non-convulsive uh, seizures. So if you partially treat a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, somebody can continue having a seizure without any motor activity. And sometimes these people escape our attention for hours or days. It's called non-convulsive uh, status epilepticus. And these people tend to have a much, much higher mortality, in, uh, in particular because they tend to be older people. So you tend to have these 75, 80-year-old people in non-convulsive status epilepticus in the ICU for days, and they end up with lots of brain damage. And this is basically because you have a complete hemostatic failure uh, in the brain. Now, what causes seizures? This is far more complicated than you need to know, but I think it's good you start getting comfortable with the things that can cause seizures because it's the things that you're going to need to be thinking about if you have a patient who comes in with them. So the black over here is acute symptomatic seizures. And you can see at the top of the screen there, acute seizures. That's what I would probably primarily focus on. This is going to be all of our primary care guys. This is going to be the family medicine, internal medicine, ER, pediatric folks. We need to pay some attention to the status epilepticus. When you start getting into the status on the critically ill, that's usually ICU docs. And the same with refractory status epilepticus tends to be folks that are in an ICU already, although we may see them in the ER in particular. So when you look at this list, <coughs> you can see a traumatic brain injury, stroke, hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhages, venous sinus thrombosis, central nervous system tumors, all right, toxic like environmental or illicit substances, alcohol withdrawal or intoxication, eclampsia and pregnant women, metabolic causes. These all tend to be in this third of acute seizures. All right. For progressive symptomatic, okay, things that slowly progress that eventually cause uh, seizures, CNS tumors, chronic infections like HIV or neurosyphilis, autoimmune inflammatory diseases like Hashimoto's or lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis. Okay, again, metabolic problems, less commonly so here. And then the last two uh, categories, remote symptomatic things like a, a traumatic brain injury a long time ago, a stroke a long time ago, um, alcohol, chronic alcohol use. These can all lead to seizure disorders. And then idiopathic. Note that half of acute seizures, almost half, uh, and in some series, half uh, are idiopathic. We don't know why they have seizures. It's either a genetic epilepsy syndrome or it's cortical dysplasia, but it's something we can never quite put our finger on except for perhaps in the history. Okay, but it's certainly not a concrete cause. As you get into the more dangerous things like status epilepticus and people in the ICU, many, many more are caused by that first series of things, right? Very uh, far fewer of those are caused by epilepsy syndrome. The big thing here is there are lots and lots of causes, but if the patient's sick, there's probably a reason. So you see other uh, people in the ICU, there's probably a reason. It's probably an acute symptomatic uh, seizure and you need to go hunting for it. But really the most common stuff that you need to think about, and this makes up about a third of all acute seizures, are toxins, trauma, and epilepsy, okay? These make up about a third combined. So you still have lots of seizures unaccounted for, but this is definitely the most common causes for seizures. Half of idiopathic, and the big ones I want you to remember are tumor, metabolic causes, eclampsia, and congenital uh, syndromes. Now, there's also something called a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, and this makes up about a third of referrals to seizure clinics. We know them better as pseudo-seizures. And if any of you have ever seen this YouTube video, she's having a seizure. That's not a seizure. That's a dance move. <laughs> now, these tend to be emotionally triggered. When they have EEGs uh, performed, there's no paroxysmal epileptic activity. There's no obvious source of a seizure. Now, these tend to be a result of a, somatofoam a somatoform disorder. So this is usually, these people usually have a history of sexual or physical abuse. Um, lots of them have a history of head injury. They also tend to have a history of chronic pain syndrome or fibromyalgia. Um, the highest incidence is in 15 to 45 year olds and women more commonly than men, which is the opposite of most seizure syndromes. <laughs> 
Now, the really important thing here is that 10 to 15 percent of these people are ultimately found to have epilepsy. And one of the difficulties here is that frontal lobe um, and sometimes front, uh, the, the frontal uh, temporal lobe seizures, particularly complex partial seizures, can look a lot like pseudo seizures. They can actually look exactly like pseudo seizures. And sometimes it can be very difficult to pick up on an EEG. So be very, very careful uh, disregarding these people who come in, even with a diagnosis of pseudo seizures, because they very well may have real, in particular, partial complex seizures. Um, now moving on, the devil's in the details, so we need to get to some specifics. So we talked a little bit about seizure types. You've got your simple partial or your simple focal. This is, focal. This is an isolated area of activity, and it can result in something like a jerking arm. Your complex partial or your complex focal, isolated to a general lobe typically, and this can be like a jerking arm that becomes secondarily generalized, but it's associated with an altered level of consciousness. Generalized tonic-clonic used to be known as grand mal, grand mal, uh, is a diffuse shaking. They have a tonic phase in which they squeeze up and then they shake all over. Okay, there's non-convulsive. We already talked about that, and then absence. Once again, status epilepticus is a seizure for more than five minutes. Okay, the other definition to this is two seizures um, between which there's no recovery of consciousness. Okay, so they have a seizure, they stop shaking, but they they during their postictal phase, they develop another seizure. Okay, so moving into more details about partial or focal seizures. Like we discussed earlier, these are divided into the, uh, the different lobes. You can have frontal, temporal, parietal, or occipital lobe focal seizures. And why do we need to know this? Well, misdiagnosis. These are commonly associated with misdiagnosis, and you'll understand when we get to talking about them just why. So it's important to know they exist. Now, I don't expect you guys to know the details about these. What I really want out of this is that you've seen this before, you've heard this, and so when you get to some of these other diagnoses, hopefully something snaps in your brain and you say, I, I think I've heard that there's something else that can cause this, okay? So try to listen, try to pay attention, try to learn something. Let's begin with frontal. Okay, so frontal, um, frontal focal seizures. Let's think about what they... Uh, what the frontal lobe does. Frontal lobe is associated with motor association. It's associated with judgment to some degree with behavior. All right, this is what you think of in teenagers. They have an, uh, a non-fully developed frontal lobe, and so they do some kind of crazy things. So this does a lot of the same things. Now, the interesting thing about these is they tend to occur during sleep. So once again, teenagers tend to sleep a lot, right? Um, it's a good group to remember this in. Once it's during sleep, they tend to be very short. If it's a supplementary motor area, then you tend to get something, well, you occasionally get something called a fencing posture. You can get these, this tonic activity that looks like a fencer. Um, it's this guy down here. You can get clonic movements. This is one of the few partial seizures that may have bilateral movements, but if it's a simple seizure, you'll have preserved consciousness. You really don't see this in other seizure disorders. Okay, sometimes these are very, very focal. Sometimes this has a Jacksonian march um, as it goes back through the temporal lobes, and then you can get secondary generalization. It's associated with salivation, facial clonic activity, facial or oral apraxia, sometimes frenzied behavior or agitation. So if you can imagine this, waking somebody up at night, um, they're called hypermotor seizures because they're very, very active. They tend to have a Tourette's-like vocalization. They swear a lot. Okay, it's very short, usually less than 30 seconds, and there's usually little to no postictal phase. So if you think about all these things, waking somebody up at night where they're thrashing around and screaming swear words, you can understand that this would often be misdiagnosed as a psychiatric disorder. A lot of times this, uh, this is misdiagnosed as a pseudo seizure. This is the most common di misdiagnosed uh, d seizure as a pseudo seizure. Sometimes this is misdiagnosed as parasomnias. Okay, so sleep disorders. This is a very, very tricky seizure, which is unfortunate because it's the second most common localizable seizure, right behind temporal seizures, which is the most common localizable seizure. It's, uh, it makes up 
of adult focal epilepsies. Now, there's a couple of important things that I think are worth remembering about this. For one, there's an association with complex febrile seizures in childhood. And we'll get to what a complex febrile seizure is, but usually febrile seizures occur in six-month to six-year-olds. It's associated with a fever. But if they last longer than normal, if they have a prolonged postictal phase or focal findings, um, things like this, then they're more likely to develop something called mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. This is because of mesial temporal lobe sclerosis. Um, which is found in about two-thirds of these folks with seizures. Okay, it's thought that this is uh, associated with damage to the hippocampus. <clears throat> this can also uh, be caused by damage to the amygdala, and this explains a lot of the symptoms that you get here. Okay, so damage to the amygdala or problems arising from the amygdala can cause uh, emotional auras like fear. These are commonly misdiagnosed as panic attacks, but these usually last less than two minutes. They're very, very brief because it's an aura versus a panic attack, which lasts longer. The amygdala can also cause autonomic uh, uh, auras, so the queasy sensation, or the most common aura, which is an epigastric rising, like going over a roller coaster hump. Okay. The amygdala can also cause olfactory auras, although these are rare, but when you hear people say they smell something burning and there's no smell of anything burning, they're probably getting ready to go down, right? Okay, this also affects the hippocampus. Like we talked about with the mesial temporal uh, sclerosis, uh, this can cause hippocampal damage, and this can explain things uh, like memory problems, particularly in non-dominant um, non temporal lobe uh, focal epilepsy. Or well, the people may uh, continue to be interactive. They may continue to talk and have a conversation, but they remember nothing of it when it's done. The other thing that the hippocampus is responsible for is experiential phenomena, right? So things like deja vu. So some of these people may have an aura, much like deja vu, only then to have a seizure. Now, when they go into the seizure, uh, people with temporal lobe epilepsy tend to have automatisms. This is dominated by automatisms, typically oral oroelementary. So lip smacking, swallowing. Um, you can have head turning, so versive movements, eye turning, things like that. Um, they can have dystonic posturing. And uh, we talked about with the non-dominant, you can be responsive and verbally interactive, but not remember. If dominant, you can have postictal aphasia. Sometimes during, you can have ictal aphasia. All right, and this can propagate to the frontal lobe. Now, um, with this, in particular, an MRI is the test of choice because of this mesial temporal sclerosis. Um, sometimes very small gliomas are found, but usually an MRI identifies the abnormalities associated with this seizure in particular. Now, focal uh, occipital seizures. These are another one that are uh, another seizure type that are commonly misdiagnosed one way or the other. These include visual distortions, sometimes unformed images like flashing or colored lights or shapes, complex visual hallucinations. So people may see familiar faces or family members. They can also have ictal blindness. So during the seizure, they can't see, and this can be uh, an eye, this can be complete blindness, this can be a hemifield. They can also have post-ictal blindness after they have the seizure, they can't see. During the seizure, we tend to see things like blinking, they can get nystagmoid uh, eye movements, and they can also have versive head and eye deviation. This is commonly, commonly, commonly misdiagnosed as an occipital migraine. Sometimes this is misdiagnosed as a stroke because people present with visual field deficits. And lastly, uh, partial or focal parietal seizures. Now, when you think about the parietal lobe, um, this tends to be your uh, motor and sensory areas, right? Usually this is sensory in particular. All right, and so your auras tend to be things like the sensation of movement, a feeling of bending or turning, the feeling that an extremity is absent. Sometimes you can get somatosensory uh, sensations like tingles, pins and needles, numbness, burning, pain. Okay, you can have ictal or post-ictal paralysis. Now, post-ictal paralysis is usually referred to as Todd's paralysis, and it can actually happen in any seizure, but I felt like this was an appropriate place to include it. Um, as we're talking about the area of the brain that tends to control this, it, Todd's paralysis can last for hours to days after a seizure. It's diagnosed by the uh, association with the onset of a seizure. Okay, it tends to be 
uh, and I, in fact, all the reports I'm aware of um, are unilateral. Okay, you shouldn't see bilateral weakness uh, or paresis. And sometimes it can be only an arm or only a leg. Okay, these seizures can also be associated with vertigo, and they can also be associated with aphasia, especially if they hit Broca's area. And these can spread to the frontal lobe, in which case you can get tonic posturing. Okay, the big ones that you guys really need to know for boards, all right, really hammer this. This is not complicated, but it's important. Okay, absence seizures. Now, remember, these are a generalized seizure. Okay, and you can remember that because um, they are absent, just like the name sounds. They are absent for the few seconds that this lasts. And the classic story is a child who was doing well in school, whose grades suddenly drop, who seems to be daydreaming, who never had a problem with this before. And those daydreams, when they stare off into space, are actually seizures. Now, the classic test questions you're going to get here are uh, in regards to the EEG. This is the only time on boards that you will be expected to know what an EEG looks or sounds like. They may or may not give you the picture. They will almost certainly tell you a 3 hertz spike and wave pattern. Okay, that is uniformly associated with absence seizures. Okay, if the child presents with the uh, onset of absence seizures between 4 and 10, it's called childhood absence seizures or childhood absence epilepsy. If between 10 and 18, it's juvenile. So basically, if they're a teenager, it's juvenile. And the only thing that's important about this is that if they present with their first absence seizure as a teenager, it's more likely to persist into adulthood. They're more likely to have other types of seizures. Okay, technically, this is associated with a blank stare motor arrest. So they just stand there slack jawed. It's very brief, almost always less than 15 seconds and really usually around three to five seconds. These kids have multiple daily seizures, sometimes dozens or hundreds of them. Now, how to remember how to treat this? This is very simple. This is There is only one medication that you're ever going to get tested on for this. And if you imagine a kid who has got his forehead on his desk saying, this sucks, think ethosuximide. It'll wake him right up. So ethosuximide and absence seizures. All right, gasto epilepsy. Uh, this is a couple of the syndromes we need to go over that I think are important that you know. Um, and you may have gotten some of these in your childhood epilepsy. This is uh, hopefully just a little review then. Um, but gasto epilepsy onset is during childhood, three to 16 years old. This is unusual in the sense that uh, the trigger tends to be eye closure. So it's called fixation off photosensitivity. Uh, as opposed to some other things like occipital migraine, which are fixation on when you see bright lights or blinking lights. Um, so gasto is fixation off photosensitivity. Uh, it tends to be associated with the occipital lobe. So these people have visual symptoms. So like visual hallucinations, visual loss, eye deviation, blinking. This is your normal occipital seizure. Consciousness tends to be preserved through these. And these kids can have a postictal headache, which sounds a lot like a migraine with a visual aura, an occipital migraine. So this is commonly, commonly misdiagnosed, and it's important to consider this, especially with the right history. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is important to mention just because it's 10% of all diagnosed epilepsy conditions. It involves generalized myoclonic seizures, so quick jerks, most commonly happens shortly after awakening, particularly if they got drunk the night before or didn't get enough sleep. And a third of these folks have an associated absence epilepsy. And this tends to be a lifelong condition. Okay, it is treatable. It, uh, these people tend to respond well to anti-epileptic medications, but they don't tend to resolve. Lastly, and I'm pretty sure you guys have probably been taught this, but to make sure, because this is very, very important, anybody that works with kids knows, is febrile seizures. Now, the easiest way to remember is febrile seizures happen between six months and six years. Okay, plus or minus, but about that age group. Up to 5% of children will have one of these in their lifetime. To be a simple Febrile seizure, it must be a single seizure in a 24-hour period. It has to be symmetrical, generalized tonic-clonic activity and last less than 15 minutes. 
Okay, they may have a short postictal confusional uh, stage. This should resolve fairly rapidly. If that is the case, this is considered a benign condition. Okay, these kids do not need big workups. And only 7% are estimated to go on to develop epilepsy. Now, that may sound like a lot, but when you think that up to 50% of people with an unprovoked seizure go on to develop epilepsy, this is a pretty low number. Okay, so uh, I had a friend make a couple slides for me just because I was running out of time. So he uh, offered that little play on my name at the top there. But red herrings, or uh, red herringtons as it were. Things you need to think about in your differential when somebody comes in with a complaint of a seizure. First of all, syncope. Sometimes syncope can be followed by a transient myoclonus, so a little shaking. Sometimes they can have posturing after they go down and upward eye deviations. To a lot of people, this sounds a lot like a seizure. All right. Now, there can also be something called an anoxic epileptic seizure. And if somebody passes out because, for instance, they went into VTAC or VFib, and their brain didn't get enough oxygen... Okay, then they may actually have some seizure-like activity that's actually associated with syncope. And this is part of the problem in diagnosing seizure in the emergency department in particular, but sometimes in the offices, you're going on an incomplete history by somebody who actually passed out. And then somebody else who is freaked out by watching their friend or family member go down. So sometimes this is a difficult distinction to make. Migraines. And we've talked about that already with the partial seizures, especially the partial um, occipital seizures and the temporal seizures sometimes can do this. Okay, the big migraines you need to think about are classical migraine with visual or somatory sensory aura, basilar migraines, and acute confusional migraines. Now also note there's an association between migraines and seizures. There's some overlap here, so if you have one, you're more likely to have the other. And then TIA, so negative seizure symptoms, like atonic seizures, can look a lot like a TIA. And atonic is uh, the drop attacks. You get very, very weak, especially a partial atonic seizure. Um, with TIA, sometimes you can get limb shaking, especially if you have um, stenosis, significant stenosis of the internal carotid artery. You can actually get limb shaking contralateral to the, uh, the carotid artery. And this can look like seizure activity, partial seizure activity. So a little more in depth, syncope um, and syncope versus seizure. Now, syncope, you need to be thinking about what kind of questions you want to ask these people because when you get to third year, you start having to do your clinicals, you need to start being able to interview patients and start needing to develop a differential diagnosis. So syncope tends to come with things like chest pain, palpitations, lightheadedness, diaphoresis, prolonged standing, or known precipitants. So it happened while they were urinating, during pain, during exercise, while lifting something heavy, which you see sometimes like this, this woman here. Um, another one we see a lot in kids, not a lot, but I've seen a few of, is uh, while brushing their hair. Okay, that tends to be syncope. A seizure tends to have post-ictal confusion versus syncope where you wake up immediately. Right, and this lasts for several minutes, up to 15 minutes maybe in a seizure. Seizures tend to have tongue biting, particularly lateral tongue biting. They may have a sense of deja vu or aphasia. They may have focal neurological findings. That's almost uniformly seizure kind of activity relative to syncope. Ask about an aura, the epigastric rising sensation. But at the end of the day, if you're not sure, be comfortable with being undecided here and work it up. If you're in the emergency room, admit it. If you're an internal medicine, family medicine guy, if you're up on the floor, take it and work it up. Okay, Especially if this is an older person or if they have an abnormal EKG. Migraines. And we already talked about these, particularly a classic migraine with an aura, acute confusional migraines, or basilar migraines. And remember, there's lots of overlap between migraines and seizure. All right. As far as the differential goes, there's also an association with syncope and stroke. We've already talked a little bit about syncope, but these four things um, commonly have some overlaps. These need to be on your differential with every person that comes in. All right, and never forget that basilar. Remember, it can be a basilar migraine. All right, this can look like a seizure. This can also be a stroke. So diagnosis, like a boss. You need to be able to get a good history. And we've talked about a lot of the things you need to ask about to try to differentiate what this is. You need to get a family history because some of these are genetic, uh, genetically predisposed. And then medications. Are they on medications for their seizures? The most common cause of recurrent seizures in an epileptic and the most common cause of status epilepticus is medication noncompliance. So not only what are you taking, but have you been taking it? I 
can't go a month in the ER without seeing somebody who came in for a seizure who hasn't been taking their seizure medications. And if you're lucky and they're taking something like Dilantin, you can get a level and prove that they're not. <clears throat> Other things to ask are things like triggers. So medication noncompliance being the big one, but also stress, sleep deprivation, fever. Have they been ill lately? Menstruation. Women tend to have uh, a higher rate of seizures during their menstrual cycle or their, their menstrual period. Flickering lights. And there was a great paper about a uh, Japanese cartoon that came on with flickering uh, blue and red lights that caused seizures in over 200 kids during the airing of that show. All right. You can ask about prodromes. Did they have a sensation that they were going to have a seizure? Did they have any auras? Any change in smell, the epigastric rising sensation, palpitations, visual scintillations, scotomas? Did they see shapes, hallucinations? Ask about autonomic phenomena like diaphoresis or nausea. Okay, and then medications. Um, medications like tramadol is one we see in the emergency room a lot, can lower your seizure threshold. Bupropion or Welbutrin, which is used for smoking cessation as, as well as depression, can cause uh, treatment resistant. Uh, seizures, stimulants, and this is especially important in children with ADHD. Um, and remember, this is the age group where they develop some of these uh, epilepsy syndromes. So they may be going on Adderall or Ritalin, um, and then that's uncovering an underlying seizure disorder. And in older folks, think about things like fluoroquinolones, so Cipro or Leviquin. So an old person with urinary tract infection who goes on one of these may end up having a seizure. Regarding labs, there's lots of labs you can get and few that you really need. You need to consider things like a basic chemistry to look at their sodium, their calcium, their BUN, and their glucose. You can consider a toxicology panel, although that rarely helps you. Um, in every uh, woman of childbearing age, you need to get a pregnancy test. Prove they're not pregnant, and this isn't eclampsia. That's something you'll learn in the OB unit, but it's a very, very important differential and a woman of childbearing age having a seizure. And then also things like a uh, CK. So chemistry maybe, pregnancy test, a CK, creatinine, ki a creatine kinase, and a lactate. And these two things go together because they tend to be elevated after a seizure. So if you're not sure if this was a seizure or syncope, that may help. They're fairly specific, about 90%, but they're only about 60% sensitive. Okay, the CK does something else for you. And particularly in a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, because these people can go into rhabdomyolysis. If you think about it, they have very intense muscle contraction. They can have lots of muscle breakdown, all right? And this can spill a bunch of extra myoglobin into the kidneys, um, which can cause renal failure. Another thing you can consider is like a VBG. You can look at their CO2. That may help if um, you're worried about pseudo-seizures, okay? But on the whole, you don't have to do much. The formal diagnosis is made by an EEG. That's basically the EKG of the brain. It monitors the electrical activity. Usually there is video EEG monitoring. You mostly see this in pediatrics. I've seen it occasionally in adults. Normally, uh, a normal one doesn't rule out epilepsy. And we've talked about frontal seizures and how they can look a lot like pseudo seizures. Sometimes seizures originate from deep inside the brain. Remember, an EEG only looks at the surface of the brain, so it'll miss a focus that's deep inside the brain. So you can have a normal EEG with an actual seizure syndrome. Other things you may need to consider are things like an infectious etiology. Do they have uh, encephalitis or meningitis? In which case you need to do a lumbar puncture. This is going to be the patient that's febrile who had a seizure. This may be the child who comes in. He's five years old. He's in the febrile seizure range. Okay, but he has a prolonged postictal phase. He's still altered well after the seizure. Okay, or they have a focal finding. Maybe this is an adult who has HIV and possibly AIDS and you're worried about a space occupying lesion. This could be like a migrant farm worker, which is more likely what you're going to see on your boards. So like a Hispanic who comes up from Mexico or Central America, um, who comes in with a new onset seizure. The most common cause of new onset seizures in that neck of the woods is sister sarcosis. Okay. If somebody came in from a trauma, you need to think about doing a CT or an MRI. Really CT because it's fast and it gives you information as to whether or not they've broken something in their head and if they're bleeding, which is what you most care about in a traumatic seizure. And then syncope. If you're concerned about syncope, get an EKG. If you don't have a really clear and convincing story that this was a seizure, get the EKG. A really good way to remember your differential here is sick drifter. 
I got this from the buddy of mine that helped me. Um, so sugar, think about uh, getting a glucose. Anybody after a seizure needs a finger stick immediately. Isoniazid. If they, too, they took too much isoniazid, um, and this is for tuberculosis, right? Then you have to treat that with uh, B6, um, with pyridoxine. This is a great ER board question. I don't know that you guys would see it as early as you are now, but uh, makes a great question. Cation, so in particular, sodium, hyponatremia, kids, febrile seizure. Drugs, you can remember that by crap, all the crap that people take, cocaine, rum, amphetamines, and PCP. All right. Withdrawal from rum or uh, alcohol. Illnesses. All right, fevers, so encephalitis and herpes encephalitis being the main one can cause temporal lobe seizures. We've talked about those already, and that's kind of the classic thing. It can cause altered mental status because of that. Trauma, TBIs and brain bleeds, um, extra, so all the talk stuff and rat poison. It's really um, short for organophosphates. Public first aid and what you do if you're out in the middle of nowhere and have no medications. Position the patient on their side. They need to be in the lateral decubitus position. Make sure their airway is open. Do not stick anything in their mouth. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Do not put anything in their mouth. They will not swallow their tongue. They may bite the side of their tongue, but that's not going to kill them. Okay, make sure that they're on their side and their airway is open. Do not stick anything in their mouth. If you have rectal diazepam available or rectal Valium, then you can use that. If not, get pillows, uh, clear, clear the site and put pillows down so they don't hurt themselves. And call 911 if it doesn't resolve fairly quickly. Targeted therapies to restore stability. Benzodiazepines are first line. In the, in the field, you can use diazepam, but really in the hospital, we tend to use Ativan or Lorazepam. Okay, but a benzodiazepine one way or the other. If they have a problem, you treat the underlying abnormality. So get a finger stick. If you're concerned about them having a low sodium for whatever reason, whether they drink tons and tons of alcohol, which can cause what's called beer potomania, but a really low sodium. If they're old, if they don't drink well, whatever the case, um, get a chemistry and treat. If you find nothing else, then a lot of times we need to start these people on antiepileptics. We'll start them on uh, Cerebix, phosphenatoin, or they can be uh, Dilantin, phenatoin, in the ER. You can consider starting these out of the hospital. It's... Um, the recommendation is that uh, this is something that can be considered. You don't have to. The same thing if they come to your office after a seizure. You can have them follow up with a neurologist or you can start them at that time. Expectant airway management. Sometimes if these people end up in status epilepticus, we have to intubate them and breathe for them while we continue to treat. And if this is a pregnant woman, magnesium sulfate. So the weird things you have to give are uh, pyridoxine, vitamin B6 for uh, isoniazid overdose and magnesium sulfate for eclampsia everything else is benzodiazepines and so you can see this active seizure if they continue to seize for more than about three to five minutes we usually give them diazepam okay on arrival i, I by the time they get an iv placed we're going to give them lorazepam or ativan okay if that's not working and they continue to seize then we look at phenotone or phosphenotone that's dilantin or cerebix Okay, you really don't need to worry past that. This is stuff that we start learning in the emergency room. You're going to learn in critical care, things like that. But you get to things like Keppra and then Propofol, at which point you typically have to intubate. So quick summary. A seizure is an abnormal synchronized electrical activity in the cortical neurons. It's an imbalance in neurotransmitters. So NMDA overcomes GABA. Okay, it's defined... Uh, epilepsy is defined if it's recurrent or persistent. So more than two episodes, more than 24 hours apart. And a lot of people have it. A provoked seizure, something like ethanol withdrawal, it's a seizure but not epilepsy, right? Because something has caused it. Once you treat that thing, they should not have seizures again. Seizure types, remember we talked about We talked about generalized seizure, which affects both hemispheres and includes uh, generalized tonic-clonic, tonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, okay? So convulsive seizures, it also includes absence seizures where they stare off. There's no convulsion, um, but they stare off into space. Okay, there's partial. So remember, there's partial complex where uh, there's altered mental status. There's simple partial, okay, where there's no altered mental status. Okay, remember your red herrings. Remember your differentials here. So things like syncope and migraine. Your diagnosis. Remember, this is primarily based on the history of the event, making sure they have a, fo a non-focal exam. All right. You may have to do some imaging. So CT in the ER if they are older than 40.
if they have focal findings, if they have a prolonged postictal phase, if it's an adult with a fever, if they have a headache after the seizure. These are all things that mean you need to get a CT in the ER because we're worried about a major process. All right. Otherwise, they can be referred out. You can get an outpatient MRI, which is really the best test for most of these, and an EEG, and then they can follow up with the neurologist. And lastly, treatment, benzos acutely and correct the underlying cause if there's something else going on. All right, here is uh, here's some references. This is the buddy that helped me out, and that is the end of the lecture. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, next time we see you, it will be over uh, stroke.